Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to NPTEL the national program on technology enhanced learning a joint venture by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science I welcome you to module 4 lecture 8 which um, deals with an important and emerging area of cultural studies more about this that is cultural policy once we do the recap of the last lecture the last lecture as you remember was devoted to cyber culture and we saw in the beginning that the word cybernetics the word cyber actually is a prefix so we have cyber culture cyber fiction cyberpunk cybernetics right so this word actually was given to us by the famous mathematician Norbert Weiner in his seminal work cybernetics or control and communication in the animal and machine the word cyber is derived from the Greek word kubernetes meaning steersman or one who is skilled in steering or in governance and the control here essentially is electronic in nature so we also found that cyber culture was referred to as a new era or what many would call a second media age in the sense that it had enormous implications for the you know shift from modernism to postmodern culture and uh, it was based on new communication systems okay so it was we do consider it surely as a continuation all right but also as marking a very important shift if not break from the older media so the new we also saw that the new cultural formations okay that come to us by way of these new communication systems by way of cyber culture are the cultural formations that that happen on the inform, information superhighway and in virtual reality so these are two um, we could say mega aspects of cyber culture and our attempt was to look at the cultural formations of identity, subjectivity of politics and power within information superhighway and virtual reality. Then we also saw, saw through Pramod Nair that cyber culture refers to the electronic environment where various technologies and media forms converge and among these as named by Pramod Nair are the internet, video games, email, online chats, home pages, bioinformatics among others then we also saw and let me end this recap by referring to some of the key issues okay that come up in a cultural studies understanding of cyber culture and these among these some important ones are globalization techno capitalism the issue of corporeality of the issues of the body e-governance identity and subjectivity of race class genders and sexualities among others okay in the information highway and in virtual reality the others are also very importantly again human rights then techno addiction and these new um, orientations new movements cultural and in intellectual movements namely post-industrialism post-humanism and post-modernism fine so today the topic of discussion is cultural policy and with cultural policy we are really nearing the end of these entire series of lectures um, the, we are not going to talk so much about identity and subjectivity power and representation here so much as we are going to talk about uh, pragmatic ways of you know we have done we have studied cultural studies right we have seen what it entails we saw we have seen its key concepts its methodologies its tools its engagement with various issues right like um, development various sites like development even time and space came into our discussion of cultural studies um, biology uh, globalization consumption right so today we are going to look at uh, something as I said which draws us close uh, you know closer to the end of our lectures and um, this is on cultural policy and what can we do 
after having studied okay the various aspects of cultural studies remember we said in uh, you know the early part of the series that uh, cultural studies is not simply something that is academic okay its counterpart is activism and we do cultural studies not simply to write exams or to write books or to give lectures but also to make a difference okay to uh, we talk about politics the politics of representation why not simply you know to deliberate on them in abstract terms or to draw generalizations but also to see how may we apply these so to, in today's lecture we are going to see some of the ways in which critics and scholars of cultural studies okay have dwelt on the issue of cultural policy so the key source texts in this lecture from which i shall be gleaning the points and from where i may use quotations from time to time and in a, in uh, in a bit to you know uh, get you get to you some important formulations made by critics so the key source texts in this lecture are chris barker's the sage dictionary of cultural studies chris barker's cultural studies theory and practice tony bennett and john frow's edited book the sage handbook of cultural analysis and simon during's edited volume the cultural studies reader again let me remind you as i have done in many cases that these are of course uh, by no means the only Uh, books that you may read in this area or the only books that i may consult but most of the quotations and the you know main formulations are drawn from these books as you are aware these are really one hour lectures and within you know uh, the time frame of uh, one hour uh, i'm trying to get to you as many formulations and may many different aspects and facets of each and every topic right so let's move on and really one of the most important persons in you know who, who has been uh, sort of rallying okay for cultural studies policy making cultural studies rallying for the effectiveness of cultural studies rallying for changes that cultural studies may eventually bring has been tony bennett and among others tony bennett for instance in putting policy into culture in essay, his essay putting policy into cultural studies says that cultural studies um as it has been largely practiced over at least the last two decades okay stands guilty really of uh, you know being at times purely semiological and that is why he says that a there has to be a critique okay if you look at the slide a critique of the purely semiological or issues only of you know meaning making and uh, of representation of of codes of encoding and decoding codes which has been a very important uh, area or aspect of cultural studies indeed it is you know contemporary cultural studies differentiates itself okay and tries to say that we have the niche that has been made been created by cultural studies is a niche which has been created by you know um uh, structuralism and post structuralist theories and their impact uh, on on various fields so a is the critique of the purely semiological and b is an again a reiteration or an insistence on materiality or on our material lives okay so this is a critique that is not uh, been given only by tony bennett but several others and my less uh, next lecture Uh, lecture 39 of this series is entitled critiquing cultural studies where i shall be taking up more of these okay so suffice it for us now to say that uh, tony bennett and others have pointed out to the fact that there has to be a certain effectiveness of cultural studies and if cultural studies has to be effective cultural studies has to see itself as a part of governance okay this is one of the point a point tony bennett makes that we cannot leave out we have to see ourselves as an arm of the government not simply as an academic exercise not an exercise where we just write essays and books okay so let's see how we can uh, how this unfolds so this um cultural the the uh, issue of cultural policy really is you know we call it the cultural policy debate right uh, this cultural culture policy debate is whether we should study culture and cultural practices and their signifying practices or uh, you know how much uh, and how much should policy be a part of it right and this is also known as the criticism policy polarity that is there are two poles criticism is one pole criticism disc, uh, discursive remember we we had said 
very early on in the, you know, in the first or second uh, lecture that um, criticism uh, or, you know, um, cultural studies is a way of talking about something, a way of criticism, a way of critiquing our cultural practices and our cultural forms, okay. So, criticism policy, whether to go in for criticism or whether to go in for policy, this has also been a polarity, okay. So, essentially this is the debate, okay, the culture policy or the criticism policy debate. So, um, one of the first persons then who we have to talk about when we talk about the role of the intellectual, okay, when we, talk, when we uh, discuss what intellectuals not only in cultural studies, but gen in general, it may also be from the sciences, could be also from, uh, you know, from technology. So, the question that was raised, was raised early on by none other than Antonio Gramsci and really Gramsci's formulation is uh, by now known by, you know, um, so, known by everyone in cultural studies and I urge you to, uh, you also to consider this very carefully, right. Gramsci made a distinction between two types of intellectuals, right. He said that on the one hand there is the traditional intellectual and on the other hand there is the organic intellectuals. By simply looking at the two terms, I am sure by now we have some idea of what he is driving at, what uh, Gramsci wanted to tell us, okay, he himself being an activist, um, he himself was, was imprisoned and, and, and uh, you know his famous work is something that all of you should read, selections from his, you know, his uh, prison notebooks is a book that is available widely also in Indian, uh, in, uh, in its Indian edition. Anyhow, so traditional intellectual and the organic intellectual, these are the two types of intellectuals that he uh, distinguished, okay, in, in uh, not just academics, but also in among the general public. And what are, who are, who is a traditional intellectual and who is an organic intellectual is what we are going to see. We are going to now look at this definition in the way Barker has formulated it, okay, in his book Culture, uh, Cultural Studies, Theory and Practice. Okay, now I am reading from Barker and we shall, uh, you know, open this up. Traditional intellectuals are those persons who fill, look at this term, okay, who fill the scientific, literary, philosophical and religious positions in society, okay. So, so for there are, for instance, there are already available platforms, there are already available jobs, uh, available professions and the traditional in, uh, intellectual, okay, uh, is an intellectual who is, who, who, who holds such a position, okay, that is sanctioned by the government, for instance, sanctioned by authority and they fill up, now the word fill here is very important, very telling I should say, okay, who fill the, uh, the scientific, literary and philosophical and religious positions in society. This would include those working in universities, schools, churches, the media, medical institutions, publishers and law firms, etcetera, okay. So, uh, people who are, who essentially therefore hold jobs, okay, in, and who hold jobs that are sanctioned as I said by power and authority. For Gramsci, wo, what do these kind, these are traditional intellectuals, right. So, what do these, what, are, what is their function in society, right. And then we shall see later on how are, you know, the, how they are different from the organic intellectual. Now, let us look at this slide here. For Gramsci, as Barker says, they produce, maintain and circulate those ideologies constitutive of hegemony that become naturalized as common sense. Now, by this lecture you will be able to I am sure relate this very well, hegemony and ideologies. Ideology is a term to which we um, had dedicated two lectures, okay, in module 2 I think. And uh, hegemony also we saw as an important Gramscian term, okay, which uh, talked about the power and uh, you know the influence and impact of institutions to which we give our consent. So, for Gramsci these, intellect, uh, these intellectuals, these, these traditional intellectuals are a they hold these traditional sort of traditional um, positions in society, traditional professions in society and they are distinguished by the organic, uh, from the organic intellectual in the sense that they are usually in tune, okay, in tune with 
the prevailing ideology and the prevailing hegemony. Now, if you go by Marxism and you remember what Karl Marx and Frederick Engels had uh, argued that the you know the ruling ideology or the ruling ideas of any age okay, uh, are the ideas of the ruling class right of those in power. So, these intellectuals are going to sort of um, go by okay, they are going to go by and as these are the words used they are going to produce, they are going to maintain and they are going to say for instance a teacher, a teacher would then maintain okay, would sir, and circulate through his or her teaching would circulate those ideas which are held by the ruling class, those ideas that are held by the ones in power. Very rarely according to the schema okay, this binary opposition, very rarely will the you know would the traditional intellectual uh, go against right, the government for instance or go against an institution institutional authority right. So, these are people who maintain so to speak the status quo as you use the word it may, who maintain the status quo and who go who sort of proliferate help in proliferating the uh, ideologies of the ruling class and thereby who sort of maintain okay, social order. Now, again um, through Barker let us see what Gramsci meant by the organic intellectual. By contrast Barker says the organic intellectuals are said to be a constitutive part okay, of working class and later feminist, post colonial, African American etcetera struggle. They are said to be the thinking and organizing elements of the counter hegemonic class and its allies. Now, by this definition okay, Gramsci um, uh, you know refers to the organic in intellectual as one who sees his or her, his or her um, you know duty so to speak okay, as one that has to stand up for marginalized communities, okay, for underprivileged communities or classes, even caste, gender okay, and who through their work okay, are going to, who through their work are going to uh, sort of um, contest right prevailing ideologies okay they will contest prevailing uh, ideologies they they are going to critique the way okay a so called social order is maintained by the ruling class okay by power and authority by giving us an ideology which is really in their service okay so the organic intellectuals okay the word organic Okay, the organic that is almost tied to the soil, okay, tied to roots, committed okay, to uh, people of you know uh, the so called lower classes okay, and the so called lower castes. So, these all the organic in, uh, intellectuals they are a part of these working, working class uh, uh, communities or of or part of feminist movement etcetera. Now, this is of course, not to say this that uh, a person in a profession say a university professor for instance or even a doctor or even an engineer it is not to say that uh, you know they that um, while they are holding right to say that while they are holding a position that uh, they are uh, they cannot be organic intellectuals right. This is not to say that you know uh, people who fall under the traditional intellectual um, you know schema that they cannot be organic intellectuals. It is not that organic intellectuals are only activists and that traditional in intellectuals are the also the university professor is always a traditional intellectual okay. Even as one holds okay, even as one holds a university position or, or one is a doctor or, or is an engineer or a lawyer within you know the setup of the traditional professions there are many okay who have served as organic intellectuals right so to be an organic intellectual it is not necessary really i feel that you have to go out okay to stage a protest okay your very work your very teaching right could be 
fulfilling all the requirements of the organic intellectual. So, you may belong to a particular class, uh, you will belong to Marx belonged to the bourgeoisie, okay, but he was an organic intellectual. So, these organic intellectuals fight against or write against the counter hegemonic, uh, you know, sorry, the hegemonic class of society, therefore, form a very important and powerful counter hegemonic critique of the working of ideology. So, a similar uh, you know, uh, distinction is made like Gramsci's by uh, Jim McGigan in his book Culture and the Public Sphere. Okay. He uh, you know like Gramsci, he differentiates between critical intellectuals and practical intellectuals. Now, you see it is a it is parallel to Gramsci's traditional intellectual and organic intellectuals and I am bringing him here. Uh, um, uh, McGigan here also just to show that you know it was uh, not only Gramsci though he very importantly he started he began this distinction between the traditional intellectual and the organic intellectual, but other critics have also made these these very important distinctions between types of individuals. So, according to Jim McGigan critical intellectuals are academic workers and practical intellectuals are cultural workers. Now, in this sense again as I say that a practical intellectual is not necessary that these are you know absolutely um, sort of um, absolutely quarantined from one another so to speak. Okay. So, a practical intellectual could also be an academic worker and a critical intellectual could also be a cultural worker. However, today's discussion being on cultural policy, we are going to look at practical intellectuals um, and what they have to give to uh, society in the form of being cultural workers. Right? A similar uh, point is also made by Michel Foucault in where he talks about the specific intellectual, okay? the specific intellectual and government or governmentality. Right? Now, you recall that the first lecture in our uh, in this module, module number 4, which was on cultural industries and cultural forms, we had occasion to uh, you know talk uh, quite at length about Theodore Adorno and his work on cultural industry. And I shall quickly quote uh, from, uh, from Adorno and see what he had to say about cultural work. So, he says here, whoever speaks of culture speaks of administration as well whether this is his intention or not. Very beautifully put, you cannot talk only of culture and say that it has nothing to do with administration. right? So, whoever speaks of culture speaks of administration as well, whether this is his intention or not. Culture betrays from the outset the administrative view. So, tied into the meaning of culture. Now, here we get another aspect of culture, which we have not really talked about much elsewhere, though it was surely there as in it whenever we talked about culture as bringing in change, uh, you know cultural studies as you know having one of its chief aims as bringing about important changes regarding equality uh, in society. Okay. Culture therefore, betrays from the outset or has built into it the administrative aspect. The task of which is looking down from uh, which looking down from on high is to assemble, distribute, evaluate, and organize. This is what we can say uh, falls into falls in the domain of cultural policy. Okay, assembling cultural products, distributing cultural products, evaluating their impact on society, evaluating their representation, also their representational impact and uh, you know organizing the way these cultural forms and cultural institutions all these will be made available to the people. Okay? So, therefore, what is cultural policy to put, put it in more formal terms, what is cultural policy and how may we define cultural policy. Okay? Cultural policy therefore, may be defined as the regulation, management and administration of cultural forms, cultural artifacts, products, institutions, industri industries, any product that we have made as a part of our or as a result of our cultural life or, or we may say again as a result of our way of life. This is very important. Okay? Therefore, cultural policy, right? So, because somebody will obviously administer, right? somebody will be in charge of administrating and, 
you know, administrating the way these, all these cultural products, you know, will be regulated, managed, and uh, administ uh, you know, administered. For instance, let me give you the example. Uh, example of censorship, okay? Censorship, particularly say of books or films. What does what is censorship? Censorship is part and parcel of cultural policy. Why? Because it is regulating the first term here, okay? It is regulating a cultural product. A film cannot be passed by the censor board, okay? So what is the censor board essentially doing as it clips some of its, you know, uh, some of its uh, parts or it, you know, stops. Uh, you know, uh, stops uh, the film from being shown altogether to the public. There is a regulation being a regulation going on. That is, there are certain policies that have been made. Okay, so also the management and administration of the institutions that are to do with, and we shall see what these institutions are. Right. So institutions, therefore, cultural policy institutions are institutions that produce and govern the form and content. Okay, both produce and govern that is regulate the form and content of cultural products. And by, what do we mean by cultural products? Again, cultural products may range from books, from media, uh, you know, uh, media products to the internet, okay, to, uh, you know, our, the way we live our lives, right. And to the educa educational system, everything, the legal system, the judicial system, okay. So, these are institutions that produce and govern the uh, form and content of cultural products. Therefore, if we want a list and if you ask, uh, you know, if we ask what are, you know, the different uh, sort of different institutions that we have referred to here of cultural policy of cultural management regulation and administration. These may be for instance, please look at this slide, art and culture councils. These are museums, these are government departments that have to do with culture and you know the proliferation and management of culture and cultural products. These are also educational institutions. Okay, as we know, culture is not simply uh, you know culture doesn't mean dance, culture doesn't mean uh, song, culture doesn't mean the theater as we under usually understand these as cult cultural. Okay, what you are taught in your schools and colleges and your universities are also cultural in nature. So, educational institutions are also part and parcel of the administration that is of cultural policy. Then media obviously, media industries and corporations um, are part and parcel of cultural policy. So, also advertising agencies. Also media obviously, media industries, media corporations are also part and parcel, they are also the wings of you know um, or the agencies of cultural policy and importantly advertising agencies. Why? Because as we saw uh, to many of us advertising, uh, advertising um, products uh, kind of decide, they create our desires, okay, they decide on important decisions regarding you know uh, regarding news, regarding purchase of objects also deciding our lifestyles, right. So, all these art, art and culture councils, museums, government departments, educational institutions, media industries and corporations and advertising in agencies among other things are what we call the agents of cultural policy. Okay. So, these agents, these are you know councils, government bodies etcetera, media corporations, what they do, do is they um, it is, uh, you know, they are responsible eventually in the formation of cultural values in people. By cultural values, again, is not meant simply what kind of music, uh, you know, is held to be uh, of high value, etc. By cultural values are also values by which we lead our life. These are essentially values created that create identities, that create subjectivities, they are values that are sort of guarded by us through ideology. Okay? So, what kind of ideology or world view is produced and disseminated by these cultural bodies okay, in the name of cultural policy is extremely important, because it has um, great implications for our lives and, and the decisions that we take. Second, these institutions have tremendous social power or cultural power. Why do they have social cultural power? They have social cultural power because you know they decide on what uh, cultural artifacts we are allowed 
to peruse, what cultural artifacts we are allowed to create. In that, of course, you'll agree that there is, a, uh, you know, there is a great deal of power that is given to these bodies. And finally, they are responsible for the production and circulation of meanings. So, therefore, what cultural studies practitioners should do, right? In order, for instance, to become uh, an organic intellectual from a traditional intellectual, what is for uh, you know, for instance, a, a university professor, okay, expected to do? Um, we can be more uh, proactive, or we can make more contribution, right, uh, to cultural policy um, by also you know helping these um, agents agency sorry of cultural policy to adopt uh, and also to remind ourselves to adopt a more pragmatic approach. Okay? I think you recall that in one of the lectures perhaps the one on language uh, we had occasion to talk about Richard Rorty and pragmatism. Right? So, instead you know of um, uh, instead of dwelling Okay, all the time on meaning production, on the semiotics of various media forms, etcetera. Uh, perhaps one of the things that cultural um, academic workers, so to speak, or critical intellectuals, as given to us by Ned Gigan, could do is to adopt a more pragmatic approach and to work with cultural producers, right? Um, in working or by working with cultural producers, what we do is we help or aid in policy creation. The um, the expertise that one gains from having done research or having taught cultural studies, right? Uh, the understanding of the politics of the signifier, the understanding of you know uh, ideologies, the understanding of the history, okay, of ideas, okay. What the the, the academic use, uh, sorry intellectual could therefore do is to steer sort of okay, is to steer policy creation or, or to enable policy creation and to steer policies to in, in what could be the right direction. Okay. This is of course, not to say that cultural workers or the organic intellectuals do not have a similar contribution to make. The point is that instead of remaining on one side of the culture policy debate or polarity, you know they as many of the scholars here in this list of books that I have you know. Uh, used or these books that were used for this lecture, m most of them, uh, if not all of them, have said that there has to be, uh, you know, a coalition of cultural workers and uh, the academic intellectuals. Therefore, Barker again. Let's go back to Barker's cultural studies. Barker, in his book Cultural Studies, therefore says that since now, why is cultural policy important? Okay? It is important because again those who have the power you know to, to, uh, to produce and control the distribution and eventually the consumption of cultural products have immense power. Okay? So, the power is A in creating official versions of something. Okay? If you create an official version, that version is, 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 is a version that one uses, many of us use, that is a version that comes down to us as the so called legitimate version. Right? So, cultural studies and cultural policy have the poli, uh, you know, policy makers can make official versions, they have the power to name okay? whatever is given to us as official versions become part of the of common sense and is accepted by many people as common sense as eventually the natural versions of things. Okay? Whereas, on the other hand we see that this is just one of the versions that has been sort of officialized right? and all these eventually legitimize some forms and some institutions of culture as being uh, you know uh, worthier so to speak as being official as and as being very powerful. And that is why Barker says that these institutions have power, these agencies have power and cultural policy therefore, they have you know it is it's extremely important because that is really the thing that links right, links cultural products to the to the people in general. Right? Therefore, meaning as we saw meaning and truth we have always we have seen this throughout our you know our lectures meaning and truth have 
A power and B are given to us by institutions of power. Therefore, cultural politics as I said to sum up has the power to name things, has the power to define things or as we saw in the lecture on discourse has tremendous discursive power okay? and you know even though there may be different ways of descriptions, okay, there are or there are different ways of definitions of thi things, only th those definitions stick or only those labels and names stick which usually have an official sanction. Okay, sanctioned by agencies of cultural policy. Therefore, Barker also says that cultural policy, now this is through Barker we understand cultural policy as A an arm of government, okay, B it is a part of social regulation, C it is used to identify the different aspects, sorry, aspects of culture and their managerial operations. We have seen all this governmentality. Uh, regulation, government sorry, regulation and management. Then also in cultural policy we should assess the forms of politics inherent in all kinds or domains of cultural practice. We should recognize the centrality of policy and the modes of strategic intervention in culture and cultural forms, particularly the production, distribution and consumption which is really saying all about these forms and institutions. Right? Therefore, one of the chief things that you know many scholars have agreed on over these years as when the you know since the beginning or you know the formalization so to speak of talking about cultural policy was made. These scholars say that one of you know one of the ways of defining cultural policy is through pragmatism. Now, pragmatism as we have seen in the lecture on language. Uh, it is defined by three things that it is it sees um, you know uh, it sees phenomena as essentially unrepresented unrepresentable you cannot represent phenomena in all their all their um, entirety why because your own cognitive apparatus and your own you know uh, notions and your old training only allow certain aspects to be seen. So, something to we have talked about uh, you know a couple of times in the lectures on representation in the first module also we have talked about it. Okay. So, it is anti representational in the sense that it says that you have to accept the fact that we cannot represent anything in its you know any phenomenon whether scientific or cultural in its entirety and hence we can only talk about representation effects. Right? Every representation is an effect, every articulation is a representation and every representation therefore, is not representation pro proper, it is a representation effect. Second, it is anti-foundationalism, anti-foundationalism uh, holds that uh, you know uh, there are no really true foundations to knowledge, there are no eternal um, givens of knowledge, knowledge is always you know provisional knowledge, the foundations of knowledge also change as we saw in our lecture on science technology and cultural studies. You remember when we talked about the cultural studies interrogation of science and technology, we uh, also there we found that science itself which purpose us to give the truth or which many believe give us you know gives us the truth science itself moves from in the case of uh, Kuhn's articulation for instance science itself moves from paradigm shift to paradigm shift. So, there cannot be a foundation or at the most there can be different foundations the variants of foundations in different times. And finally, it is anti realist in the sense that it does not pragmatism does not say or claim to any full knowledge of rea of what is reality. Okay. So, essentially of course, this is an area in, in philosophy, but it has come into cultural studies why because it ties in largely with many of the central tenets of cultural studies of you know representation being problematic of foundations being always provisional okay, and of course, discursive and an anti realist um, anti realist uh, orientation. Okay. And Again, all these aspects are to be 
used or are to be appropriated for social reform, this being the most important aspect of cultural policy. So, um, before we wind up this lecture, you know, you may, you may uh, think why, you know, there have been policies, there have been, for instance, not that museums and, you know, art councils, etcetera, were not there and they did that, that they did not do any sort of, uh, you know, um, cultural administration. The issue of cultural policy really came in with this issue or, or you know or kindred issue that is the politics of difference, right. Um, if race, gender, sexuality and class okay, are built into cultural forms, right, then the politics of difference has to be the informing so to speak or the motivation, right, the motivation behind cultural policy. Uh, a way of say you know describing cultural policy could also be in the sense of policing right policy as policing hmm? so if we are to be sensitive to issues of race gender sexuality and class then we have policy has to see there have have to be policies that are going to see that certain races certain gender sexualities and classes are not misrepresented okay so that the hegemonic dominant order um, are you know order does not misrepresent or you know continue to make these make some races classes genders etc um, marginalized all the time right so this is one uh, a way in which the politics of difference has um, contributed to at least to what we may call contemporary cultural policy studies then we would um, I would like to refer to Andrew Milner okay, in his book Contemporary Cultural Theory. He says that a democratic common culture cannot be made from within the intellectual class itself and this is again uh, talking about the importance of policy and the practical worker, cultural worker. A democratic common culture cannot be made from within the intellectual class itself or the class that class alone, but only from those within those exploited and oppressed classes and groups, the cultural lives of which have proved by turn the objects of realist neglect, postmodernist modernist disdain and postmodernist pastiche. A very a very loaded statement here. Okay. He says that that um, to be truly democratic in the sense of representation at least to be fully representational of all classes and all um, all gender uh, you know all sexualities all uh, races classes etc okay we cannot rely only on the intellectual class the op the members of you know or what he calls those within the exploited and oppressed class according to milner bring in a certain experience Okay, bring in a certain immediacy and if I, one can hazard this word a certain authenticity because of a background of or a history of exploitation and oppression and these classes he says very importantly in these last words which are very powerful said the cultural lives the way of life the cultural products and institutions of these classes okay, have been the objects of neglect by the you know the culture of the realist the realist movement they have been the disdain of modernism particularly modernism of you know the high, high modernism kind and postmodernist pastiche for instance in the sense that you know uh, bits and pieces from these marginalized cultures are brought in in a token sort of a way okay into into uh, issues of representation but Postmodernist pastiche or postmodernist sort of collaging, okay, collaging of uh, you know bits and pieces from marginalized groups will never you know uh, really liberate the marginalized classes, and that is why, as Milner said, says here in this quotation, okay, we cannot rely only on the intellectual class. So Milner somehow thinks that there the authenticity comes only from. Uh, one who has been through the structures and realities of domination and oppression. I would like to end this with an important point further that Milner makes that is you know we should not say again you know to, to put a caveat to what Milner says really we cannot say simply that those who have been through you know oppression 
those who have been through domination in their lives uh, that they are the they are the ones who are going to have always going to have a balanced view so to speak there is also a danger of uh, a counter assertion a counter representation okay which shows you know only their way of life to be authentic to be uh, you know where there is no problematization of a counter you know a representation from the from the other side so to speak okay so we have to be careful of the word authenticity here that is why um, you know we have put this in single inverted commas and we have to see as it is mentioned here in this quotation that move is precluded by the logic of post structuralism however if whiteness and blackness are each constituted within and through discourse then there can be very importantly there can be no extra discursively real black or real post colonial identity to which a multicultural or post colonial cultural politics might appeal for validation okay so this is extremely important from a post structuralist point of view again this is now you are, we are again problematizing even cultural policy okay if cultural policy as has been said argued by many critics has to you know rely more and more on the practical worker and the one with the experience of oppression and domination so if we you know if we believe all the time that the narrative that is coming to us uh, you know from counter assertion that that is a true narrative then in that sense we forget that even the narrative of authentic black authentic why you know or, or authentic feminine feminism or authentic uh, you know sexualities that you know counter sexualities these are also you know ascribed or these are also uh, sorry available to us in language now the richness of cultural studies therefore is this that even as we understand the fact that things are given to us in language the language is the you know mediating uh, factor uh, even then we can also formulate cultural policies okay which even as it sees or uh, you know uh, even as it accepts the fact that cultural um, realities are always given to us in discourse through discourse there is um, a very important understanding of the fact that a pragmatic after all a pragmatic um, line has to be taken by both academicians and cultural workers there is no last word to this really this debate is a very strong one and this debate is going to to continue there will always be workers from the cultural front and there will always be the traditional intellectuals and the critical intellectuals okay but the fact is the, uh, what I'm saying is the growing importance of cultural policy in cultural studies is one very healthy side. So let's go to the discussion. So the first question: What are the two types of intellectuals according to Gramsci? According to Gramsci, there are two kinds of intellectuals, and these are the traditional intellectuals and the organic intellectuals. And if you uh, have to you know, explain this, and you say that the traditional intellectuals are those intellectuals who hold the traditional uh, you know positions in society and um, uh, you know just holding a traditional position in society does not mean that one cannot be an organic intellectual. So, the traditional intellectual according to Gramsci is one who uh, you know who believes in and one who helps in the proliferation of the dominant ideologies of the time of the dominant the ideas of the dominant classes okay whereas the organic intellectual is one who is you know a who usually comes probably from comes from uh, the working class or is engaged in the feminist movement okay who is the as the word organic suggests here who is tied to roots who is tied to the soil who who is you know whose works now even if one is a traditional in intellectual it does not mean as we saw that one cannot be an organic intellectual the work done from the platform of traditional intellectual at least from the platforms of traditional uh, you know institutions like the universities for instance one can also make important contributions as an organic intellectual. Second we also saw through McGigan that uh, you know corresponding to 
Antonio Gramsci's formulation, we have critical intellectuals who are the academic workers, which corresponds to the traditional intellectual of Gramsci, practical intellectuals who are the cultural workers who correspond to the organic intellectuals as given to us by Gramsci. What is cultural policy concerned with? This is our second question. Cultural policy is concerned with the regulation, management and administration of cultural forms, institutions and products. And these are institutions that produce and govern the form and content of cultural products. Then what are the instruments of cultural policy or what are the agencies of cultural policy? Uh, these agencies or instruments are among others, they may take different names, right, different labels in different countries, but usually they are, we understand these as councils of arts and culture, these are museums. For instance, what is going to be represented in a museum? You can, you know, you can un unpack some of these words, if, you, if there is a law, you know, question carrying more marks, you can say, for instance, what is going to be shown or showcased in museums as being primitive right uh, what is going to be showcased in museum as in museums as having cultural value okay uh, what what is shown in the name of ethnicity etc these are hugely you know important questions from the point of view of power and politics okay when you go to a museum we simply consume art, you know the uh, the uh, the artifacts being shown there as Per, as per the labels perhaps that are given or the brochure that you have in your hands. Okay. Cultural politics, cultural policy uh, would have to be reformulated by you know these investigations into the very representation okay, in these brochures and in these labels of museum artifacts for instance. Then departments of culture right in governments okay, which after all they are the ones these are the departments that regulate you know the uh, the department and I give you an example of for instance the censorship board uh, in our country for instance okay, and, and in all countries. So, these government departments are the ones really that are going to eventually decide what comes to you as a cultural product and what does not and in what form and content also that these come to you. Then as I, as I said educational institutions are also you know part of the agencies that are responsible for cultural policy in the sen sense that the educational boards and institutions they decide what is going to be circulated to students. Then media industries and corporations and this uh, you know, uh, you know uh, we do not have to even explain we have talked about this so much in media and culture industries and commodities new media etcetera. Advertising agencies are also part and parcel of cultural policy making. So, um, this uh, you know really brings us to a close or you know as far as the distribution of topics in these lectures on cultural studies as a distribution is concerned. Okay. Cultural policy really is the last uh, topic in the sense of being a topic proper. The next two lectures are really by way of closure in the sense that um, in the next lecture we are going to talk about uh, you know the critique of cultural studies how you know or you know some limitations of cultural studies as a discipline right how cultural studies uh, can be better by sort of paying heed to sometimes quite vituperative criticisms that are levied against this domain we shall see what uh, why many uh, react so sharply to cultural studies as a discipline so that we can learn from these and make our discipline more strong and after that in the last lecture in lecture 40 we are going to do a uh, summing up of what we have seen or what we have talked about, what we have deliberated upon in all the lectures you know from the, from the first lecture to lecture 39 and we are going to see what we have learnt. Okay. So, let us stop here for, for today and we shall meet for the next lecture which is on critiquing cultural studies. Thank you. <laughs>